produce the apparently spontaneous manifestation of Amritha, a nectar said by those who've tasted it to be unique in all the world for its exquisite taste and aroma. The origin of Amritha is mysterious. Those most familiar with it compare it to the legendary nectar of the gods and claim that it is materialized from another dimension. This peculiar phenomenon is only a very ordinary one among those attributed to a man believed by his followers to possess extraordinary psychic powers. An Indian mystic and guru, self-named Sasya Sai Baba. The devotees of Satya Sai Baba, who profess to have witnessed his performance of events outside the scope of our present understanding of material reality, come from all over the world and from all walks of life. Peasant farmers, wealthy businessmen, a number of India's leading officials in government, science, and education have by now thoroughly documented what appear to be his exceptional powers, or siddhis, the ability to act upon natural forces which the West has only recently begun to acknowledge in the new science of parapsychology. What you are about to see are occurrences which may be unacceptable to you in the context of our rational conception of a reality framed by mathematical logic and physical laws. Try to keep an open mind, however, for some of the feats of this man of mystery have been captured on film, and you will see them now, actually happening. It was probably the harshness of the land the merciless nature of the climate, which first gave to the Hindu his stoic acceptance of life, coupled with the longing for eventual release from it, for nirvana. India's searing, continually recurring droughts are never eased so much as overthrown by the inevitable floods of the monsoon, and the heat is as deadly as famine. Samsara, the karmic cycle, the wheel of life, day into night, life into death, into rebirth. The world and all the things of the world, all human perceptions, thoughts, feelings, and desires are maya, a veil of illusion which prevents our seeing a deeper reality behind it. Man or avatar, the incarnation of God in man, as his devotees believe him to be. Satya Sai Baba is part of the Eastern tradition in religion and philosophy. He uses the Eastern conception of Maya, for example, to explain how he reaches beyond the veil to perform what we who can't see behind it must regard as miracles or feats unexplainable by material laws. Besides the alleged ability to materialize objects from thin air or from another dimension, some of the psychic powers claimed of Sai Baba by his followers are the ability to read minds and see into the future, to cure disease by miraculous means, the ability to project his astral body anywhere in the world and to adopt other human and animal forms, and, hardest of all to accept, the ability in some cases to bring one back from the dead. For the protection of the virtues, for the destruction of evil doers, and for establishing righteousness on a firm footing, I incarnate from age to age. An oft quoted verse from the Bhagavad Gita, the long philosophical poem which serves with the Vedas as India's Bible.
reincarnation. We in the West generally refuse to take such an idea seriously, nor do many of us Western rationalists believe in the existence of psychic or occult phenomena in general. But the world of the occult, of the supernormal, has long been accepted in the East, with its many yogis, fakirs, and holy men. And reincarnation is fundamental to Eastern theology. Can this contradiction between two great cultures be solved as easily as by saying, we are right and they are wrong? The man who now calls himself Satya Sai Baba was born Satya Narayana Raju on November 23, 1926. He was a precocious child, a benefactor through his not always terribly willing family to the endless stream of beggars who passed by their house, a natural vegetarian who abhorred the thought of killing or mistreating animals, and to many of the children in his village, a guru who mysteriously produced things like fruit, candy, and lost pencils from an apparently empty bag. Then, when he was 13, Satya underwent a dramatic change of personality. For two months, those close to him believed the boy to be possessed by a demon. At the end of this time, he suddenly declared to his astonished family that he was the reincarnation of a little-known but much-respected sadhu, or holy man named Sai Baba of Shirdi. The original Sai Baba had died eight years before Sati was born. The length of time he had told his devotees would elapse before his reincarnation. Walter and Elsie Cowan had an incredible story to tell after their last visit to Sai Baba. Mrs. Cowan lives in Santa Ana, California. Her husband died in June 1973. It was on Christmas that I was taken sick with pneumonia and died on Christmas Eve about two and a half, three hours later. My lungs filled up with phlegm and I just smothered to death. The hotel had been alerted and a doctor was on his way. The doctors pronounced that I was dead and they loaded me into this morgue wagon and uh, shut the door but it didn't lock and every time it would stop at a crossing my body would roll back and forth and when it stopped the start up it would roll the other way and I was very much afraid my body was going to go out onto the street. I knew I was dead but my consciousness kept going along at all times and I try to convey to the drivers to shut the back door, lock it. And they, of course, I couldn't get through to them at all. And I was fretting about that until we got to the morgue and they took me out. And the two men carried the, me in the stretcher and dumped me on the bed. And didn't straighten my legs out, one leg was above the other, and uh, I was quite concerned about the lack of feeling or care they were giving to me. I could see it but I couldn't convey anything to them. The nurse came in and straightened my body out and put cotton in my mouth and nose and my, in my ears and pulled a sheet up over my head. And I was thoroughly satisfied then and I sort of figured that was the end of my body and I was completely free. I had absolutely no fear at any time and dying is a pleasure. It is not a hardship. And then I found myself in a great hall with Sayabama alongside of me. Sayabama 
talk with me while I was there in this large hall and uh, asked me whether I wanted to return to my body or not. I thought of my wife, and there is a definite uh, inborn feeling in every man to preserve his, his body and his physical life. And that had quite a factor, I think. Uh, if it wasn't for that innate desire, there probably wouldn't be too many people on Earth. Well, as I have always said, that I did not complete the work that I had intended to do, that I was born to do. And uh, he arose and, and addressed the judge and very respectfully, and the judge was very respectfully respectful to him. He knew him apparently very well. And uh, he said, this soul has not completed the work that he was born to do. And I most respectfully ask that this soul be returned to his body in order that he might complete the work that he was born to to do and to further my work. And uh, the judge looked at us for a second or two and said, so be it. And then we were told that Baba came in the night and took off the sheet and undrepped his nose and eyes and whatever they do at that time and uh, rubbed a booty on his chest and breathed a breath of life in him. And the next thing I knew, I was right back standing alongside my body, back in the hospital. Then I opened my eyes, and uh, I looked at my body, and I said, uh, I might have made this mistake in deciding to return to it. It seemed like going right back into a cesspool. And, uh, and I hesitated, and I said, I'm into it now, I might as well carry it on. And so I went into my body, and that very instant I was right back into the old grind of breathing and trying to get my breath and, uh, and going through all the sufferings of a person as sick as I can be and still be alive. And I opened my eyes and saw my wife I said, you look beautiful in pink. Richard Buck, a successful record producer, initiated and administers with his wife, Janet, the Los Angeles Sai Baba Center. Sai Baba says that there is nothing that isn't God, that this whole creation is just an expression of God, and so we are all part of God in the same way that he is part of God. He's expressing that aspect in a way that is far more visible than most human beings. Therefore, some people uh, like to think that he is God. And he's saying, yes, but so is everything else. The booty, described by Sai Baba as sacred ash, has become, in effect, his trademark. He produces the fragrant, sweetly pungent substance repeatedly at gatherings of his followers. It is said to have been prescribed internally and externally for a multitude of various ailments, many of them normally serious enough to require surgery. Yet there are innumerable accounts of followers who have been healed by the booty alone, many of the cases extremely well documented. On this occasion, an important annual festival at his ashram in southern India, over a silver statue of Sai Baba of Shirdi, Satya Sai Baba appears to materialize the booty from a vase as one of his public miracles before thousands of devotees.
Until recently, accessible only by dirt roads, Puta Party is located in the state of Andhra Pradesh in southern India. Just outside the small remote village where Sai Baba was born and grew up is his ashram. Prasanti Niliam, which means abode of the highest peace, is the home of several hundred of Sai Baba's most devoted followers. Another Sai, Gita, the Guru's biggest devotee, and put a party's only pet elephant. Unless perhaps you count Ganesha, the elephant headed Hindu god who removes obstacles, and whose shrine this is, recently installed in the ashram. But then Sai Gita can stand on two legs, and she's a real elephant. Buddha Party's only pet elephant. This house now stands on the site of Sai Baba's birthplace and the home of his youth. It was while he was living here that the strange events occurred which began by word of mouth to carry the name Satya Sai Baba out to India and the rest of the world. At seven o'clock on the evening of March 18th, 1940, 13 year old Satya suddenly leaped into the air with a shriek, holding his bare foot. His family feared he'd been stung by a scorpion and would not survive. But he slept that night without apparent pain or sickness. Then, 24 hours later, he fell unconscious and remained so for a day. When he awoke, his behavior was strange. He alternately laughed and cried and quoted long Sanskrit passages of poetry and philosophy far beyond the scope of his formal education. At times he became stiff and appeared to those around him to leave his body then described distant places which his parents said he had never visited. For two months, his family did everything in their power to exorcise the demon they believed had taken possession of the boy. Satya accepted these efforts patiently, even when they became tortures at the hands of a respected but feared exorcist to whom the demon had become a personal challenge. Among other things, this expert in devil craft shaved the boy's head and carved three crosses into his scalp. Then, on the morning of May 23rd, Satya began to materialize flowers and sugar candy, apparently from nowhere. An excited crowd began to gather. Satya's father was furious at this show of sleight of hand, or worse, black magic. To his exasperated question of, who are you? The boy said calmly but firmly, I am Sai Baba. Then he declared that he had been reincarnated through the prayers of an ancestral sage that a holy man be reborn in his family. No one had difficulty accepting the idea of reincarnation, but it was difficult for some of Satya's acquaintances to accept the possibility that he was the actual reincarnation of a man regarded by his followers as a saint at the time of his death. Show us a sign, they pleaded. With a quick and unexpected gesture, Sai Baba threw a bunch of jasmine flowers onto the floor. There they clearly spelled out, in Telugu script, the language of the village, Sai Baba. In October of his 13th year, Satya Sai Baba left school and began to gather devotees around him. The number of his followers grew. Sai Baba's followers grew in number until it became necessary to establish an ashram where the most devoted could live with their guru and where those seeking his guidance could meet with him. 
Presentinillium was completed in 1950. Here and at Brindavan, his summer residence just outside of Bangalore, Baba receives people from India and around the world. He is not the leader of a cult or movement. Sai Baba preaches neither a specific religion nor worship of himself. He tries rather to help the individual see and attain the divinity inherent within himself by heeding the scriptures of his own particular faith, by disciplined chanting and meditation of the name and form of God, by gradually stilling the earthly desires of the senses. I only prompt you to discover your own reality, says Sai Baba. That is my mission. The end of wisdom is freedom. The end of culture is perfection. The end of education is character. The end of knowledge is love, love, love. Sai Baba seems to live in two distinct worlds, the peaceful, meditative world of his inner self and the clamorous world of the many seeking his help. When you see Swami do a miracle, he's so natural about it that it doesn't really astonish you. And once you accept that he can do miracles and you see it for yourself, then that's one step in realizing that he's not an ordinary person. Baba has a saying which applies to the contrast between these two ways of life. Man must grasp God with the right hand and the world with the left. Swami began to talk about the merger of the individual soul with God. And he said, just as the devotee longs for God, so God longs for his devotee. And he was trying to illustrate with his fingers. He was saying, you know, how uh, in a cave you have a, a, the lime builds up and it drips down as a stalactite and forms a stalagmite and, and they both seem to be coming towards each other. And, and he waved his hand and he made a round black stone. And he passed it around. Then he took it back and he blew with his breath a pattern in it, two concentric circles that were joined at the center. Later on, we found out that this is a soligram, and a soligram is something that symbolizes the union of the individual soul with the divine, and it's made from a fossil, and we saw Swami make this fossil with his very breath. These new residence halls under construction at Prasantinilium are a more conventional manifestation of a man's will than Amrita or Vibhuti. What they lack in mystification, they make up for in their concrete evidence of Sai Baba's increasing significance in India. Schools and hospitals as well, like the one whose dedication by Baba you will see in a moment, financed by devotees in Moga, are coming into existence under Sai Baba's influence. The most spectacular of the accounts concerning Sai Baba and health, however, have less to do with hospitals than with his alleged powers of healing. Ulcers, gallstone, lameness, the loss of vision, insanity, severe burns, tuberculosis, leprosy, cancer, heart attacks, strokes, and, as we have heard from the Cowans, even death itself. All these are among the maladies claimed by Sai Baba and his followers to have been cured or prevented by the man of miracles. There are numerous accounts of Sai Baba's taking an extremely severe illness or injury of a devotee upon himself. In other words, diverting its symptoms from the victim to his own body when he felt the devotee would not otherwise survive. And there are not only reports of surgical instruments having been materialized by Baba for his own use, but of his actually manifesting himself in the body of the surgeon to perform critical operations. While, of course, many such stories have been passed from person to person until names, dates, and facts are impossible to authenticate, there remain many accounts which are impressively documented and reported firsthand by reliable sources. Mr. H. N. Banerjee, for example, was at the time of this particular incident professor of physiology 
in the medical college of Balior in North India. His letters to a scientist at Prasanti Nilium give this account of his niece's reprieve from death. A 38-year-old mother of seven, she was given no more than eight months to live after a particularly virulent form of cancer was discovered in her breast. An appeal for help reached Sai Baba, and he produced some babuti which was sent to the professor. It is reported to have immediately relieved the patient's extreme fever of 107 degrees. Eighteen days later, she had recovered from anemia connected with her illness and was now able to take cobalt-60 treatments, which had been discontinued because of the complications they were causing. A month later, she was discharged without the ovariotomy, which her doctors had planned as a precautionary measure. Three years later, with monthly checkups by a specialist, she was still doing fine. Was it the booty or something else? Perhaps the cobalt treatments, which brought about this apparent cure? If it was the cobalt-60, why did the complications connected with its use suddenly disappear? Professor Banerjee, who is now head of the biochemistry division at Regenda Memorial Research Institute for Medical Sciences at Putna, has found an answer that satisfies him. Miracles do happen, he wrote in a recent letter to the ashram. Whether you call them so or say it's nothing but Baba's grace and mercy. Of education in India, Sai Baba says, people now seem to be losing faith in virtues, for the educational system does not assign any place for spiritual teaching or training. He says that education without character is useless. Its aim should be to build character and instill a sense of morality. Baba has set himself this goal, to establish a minimum of two colleges in each of the Indian states. Four colleges and a co-educational trade school for grade and high school youngsters were in operation by mid-1973. Baba's devotees in Delhi. Not surprisingly, the themes of this dramatic presentation staged in his honor are the traditional moral precepts of the Hindu scriptures.
Rajendra Devi is a Sai Baba devotee who is internationally known as a yoga teacher and author of several books on yoga. When I first time saw Baba, and this was in 1966, one of his devotees told me so many stories about his miracles. But there is one which I always was longing to see because I saw everything. But she said about him gathering sand on the river and then just making a little drawing and taking out the thing he was drawing. This I've never seen before. such as this. The answer is to say that God's power exceeds time and place and is not subject to time and place. It causes wonder to you, but to me they are just my nature. All the miracles of Baba, or as he calls them Leelas, which means place, divine place, are nothing in comparison to a real miracle, which is completely changing a person, no matter how cynical, how unbelieving, how hard-boiled he or she may be. Ravi Shankar, world-famous virtuoso of the sitar and Indian music, has long been an admirer of the guru. Hollywood film producer Joe Reardon and his wife Diane are devotees of Sai Baba after a good bit of initial resistance on Joe's part. Diana, and my wife here arrived back from India and started to tell me about Sai Baba. Of course, I thought she was insane, and at many parties she would mention his name and the miracles he performed. Eventually, I got to the point where I was up to here with Sai Baba, and I used to say to him, look, I don't want to hear about this character. So eventually, Diana convinced me to read a, two books on Sai Baba. So I read the two books. And I presented it to friends of mine who were in the theatrical business. And their reply was, well, or what are you going to ask him for? So my reply was always, well, there's not much I need right at the moment. And uh, what I think I'll ask him for is a rainbow. So they all laughed at this. Well, to cut the story short, we took off and we went to India. And after unpacking our car, we took off and we went to the top of the mountain. We got up to the top of the mountain. There was a young lady sitting there that we had met previously uh, in Bangalore. While they were sitting there talking amongst themselves, I glanced over at Diana's shoulder. And as I did, slowly appearing over her right shoulder, a rainbow. And it started straight up, never curved. I said to Diana, take a look over your shoulder. She looked over her shoulder and she said, oh my God. Well, that evening, around seven or eight o'clock, a man came to our door, knocked on it, said, uh, Mr. Reardon, uh, Sai Baba would like to see you tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Well, at nine o'clock in the morning, we were there. Truthfully, I felt like an idiot, but a little bit still stunned about that rainbow. I think about five minutes pass by in silence when all of a sudden I see these bare feet in this robe appear and down comes this bushy character's hair out to here, big smile on his face and I must admit warmth that I've never felt before. 
And he walked over to me, and he looked me square in the eyes, and he slapped me across the shoulder, and he says, How are you, character? We are skeptical of powers like those credited to Sai Baba because they seem to contradict what we believe to be real. Science tells us what is real. But what science cannot explain is not necessarily beyond the capability of men of science to believe in. There are highly respected scientists among Baba's followers. Dr. Y.J. Rao, a professor at Osmania University in Hyderabad, attests to having witnessed Sai Baba transmute a piece of granite to, of all things, sugar candy. Rao's science? He is head of the university's geology department. And Dr. S. Bhagavantam, formerly director of the All India Institute of Science, now with the title of scientific advisor to the Minister of Defense in Delhi, tells an interesting story of a special materialization in his honor. On one occasion, Baba made a teasing remark to him about the all-knowing attitude of many scientists and their general ignorance of the kind of wisdom found in the great Hindu scriptures. Bhagavantam replied that Robert Oppenheimer, often called the father of the atomic bomb, when questioned by the press about his feelings after it had been exploded for the first time, quoted a verse from the Bhagavad Gita. At this point, Baba scooped up a handful of sand. When Dr. Bhagavatam held out his hands to receive it, the sand, he claims, became a red-covered copy of this classic book, printed in Telugu script, his native tongue. Names of printer and publisher were nowhere to be found. In bewilderment, Bhagavatam asked Baba where the book had been printed. It was printed at Sai Press, the guru answered with a smile. I have chosen Telugu script because it will be easier for you to read. Bhagavantam, who describes himself as a rational man, practically an agnostic, who would not accept anything without a scientific explanation, has resolved what was once a conflict between his scientific training and the evidence of his senses. He says, In our laboratories, we scientists may swear by reason, but we know that every time we have added a little to what we know, we have learned of the existence of many other things, the true nature of which we do not know. Thus, while adding to knowledge, we add more to our ignorance, too. What we know is becoming a smaller and smaller fraction of what we do not know. Sai Baba transcends the laws of physics and chemistry. And when he transcends a law, that fact becomes a new law. To his devotees, Sai Baba is an incarnation of God, or the spirit of God as devout Christians believe Jesus was. To them, this miracle stands above all the others attributed to their guru. Yet, as with Christ, it has probably been Sai Baba's alleged demonstration of supernatural powers which initially attracted a great many of his followers to him. Baba refers to his feats as calling cards and says it is wrong to call them miracles. They are only evidence, he says, not an exhibition. They are like a place for it by natural behavior. As the intention of the word arises in the mind, the thing is made. It is ready when I want it. The moment it is willed, the thing comes to hand, or happens where I will it to happen. As for referring to his feats as magic, Baba points out that if a magician not only collected no money for his demonstrations, but gave away everything he materialized, he would soon be out of business. Sai Baba's materializations are given away. They are cherished for years by his devotees. While a magician must concern himself with basic economics, money should be no problem for a man of miracles, and it apparently is not for Baba. His devotees, many of them quite wealthy, say it is a blessing to be able to help ease with their money the needs cited by a guru who gives them so much love. These needs appear to be exclusively those of the people. Baba's personal requirements seem negligible. He lives in only one sparsely furnished room, eats little more than rice, curds, lentils, and dal, a variety of bean protein, and wears nothing but the simple gowns, called dotis, which you have seen here. Of his devotees, Baba says, 
I give to them what they want. So they will want what I have come here to give them. A search for deeper understanding of themselves. Janet Bach. This was materialized by Sai Baba in the early 1970. It was my first visit to Baba. And the day before I was to leave, he looked at me and he acknowledged that I was leaving. And then with his hand made that motion, closed his fist, and when he opened it, there it was. Now let's look in slow motion at what appears to be the materialization of a necklace, a rather difficult object to produce from one's sleeve in front of dozens of people. Dr. Samuel Samwise, a San Diego psychiatrist, may or may not represent the skeptic in each of us, given the opportunity to inform our skepticism with personal experience. His impressions are the result of three trips to put a party. Many people have asked me this question, uh, if whether the phenomenon I saw was a um, mass uh, hysteria or mass delusion, mass hypnosis, neurosis, psychosis, or whatever the term, and it's my firm belief, after living with him and experiencing him for um, one month, that uh, he is genuine and authentic, and what he does is genuine and authentic. I say that it's clearly beyond my comprehension. Whether or not we are willing to grant a comparison of Sai Baba with Jesus Christ, there is one clear distinction between them, which should prove interesting in the years ahead. As pointed out by Howard Murphitt in Man of Miracles, his informative book on this Indian mystic, the miracles of Christ must be accepted on faith. Those of Satya Sai Baba, living as he does in a time of instant electronic global communications, we will have increasing opportunity to observe and judge for ourselves.